Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In the previous lectures, we have studied lexical categories and functional categories. Now it's time to move to the following category, which is that of inflectional categories. As we have done for the previous categories, we are going to see the definition of inflectional categories and we are going to see the inventory of these inflectional categories we will study them each one per se concerning the definition of the inflectional categories uh, the term category in some approaches refers to classes and functions in its narrow sense for example a noun is a category okay the verbs are a category subjects okay predicate noun phrases verb phrases all these are called types of categories more specifically it refers to the defining properties of these general units the categories of the noun for example include number gender case and countability and of the verb for example tense aspect and voice in this section we are talking about the grammatical categories in the second sense so uh, basically, the term category can be used to refer to two kinds of uh, classes, grammatical classes. The, the class which includes nouns, verbs, adjectives, and so on, or the class which includes functional categories like prepositions, negative markers, conjunctions, and so on. It can also be used to refer to other kinds of categories which are mostly inflectional that is they are affixed to nouns or to verbs or sometimes to adjectives depending on the language so in this uh, lecture about inflectional categories we are using the term category in the narrow sense in which it refers to aspects of language such as tense uh, mood uh, voice uh, agreement and so on In the latest versions of genitive syntax, functional categories are defined as items of the lexicon without substantive content. They carry inflectional or grammatical content of a sentence. Thus, they can be realized either as free morphemes, such as prepositions, as we have seen, and pronouns, determiners, and these are called functional categories. Or sometimes these functional Categories can be realized as bound morphemes. In this case, they are called inflectional categories, such as the third person singular S, the plural S, the simple past ED, the comparative ER, the superlative EST, and so on. These are called inflectional categories. But note that sometimes, especially in English, inflectional categories are not morphologically realized. That's why we have, for example, in the, in, in, in the present tense, the only case in which it is realized is the third person singular where you have S. The other cases of the conjugation of the verb are similar. When you say I go, you go, they go, okay? It's, uh, all of them are, have the same uh, uh, form. There is no inflection of the, uh, uh, the person here. Uh, so yeah, the only case you have is the one of third person singular in which you add an S. Uh, concerning the inventory of the inflectional categories, uh, okay, the list includes basically uh, uh, many uh, elements uh, such as uh, tense, uh, number, gender, mood. So by at large, the inventory of inflection categories in English can be classified into three types. Those that are conventionally associated with noun or nominal categories, uh, and those that are associated with verbal categories, such as uh, V, uh, the verb and its auxiliaries. And finally, those that are compatible with both, which means they go with both with the nominal categories and verbal categories. The list of inflectional categories comprises, but it is not necessarily limited to the following items. 
we have number, person, gender, tense, aspect, mood, case, voice, agreement. Now we will start explaining each one of these. Okay? So, first of all, we start with number, the category of number. Number is a grammatical category used for the analysis of word classes displaying such contrasts as singular, dual, plural. So, when we use the term number in English, for example, okay, it is realized on nouns, okay, it is not realized on adjectives, uh, unlike French, in which we have number realized on nouns and adjectives and also verbs. And there are only two number forms, the singular form and the plural form, as such as dog, dogs, student, students, and so on. Uh, I, I, uh, I reiterate, reiterate again that we are speaking about English. Number is also found in the inflections of pronouns and some determiners such as he laughs, they laugh, this man, these men, and so on. So as you can see, we have either singular or plural. We can find the dual form of number in other languages like Arabic. When you say kharajtu, uh, that's, uh, for example, uh, uh, singular, and then kharajtu ma, that's dual, and kharaju, that's uh, plural. In other languages, for example, French, the manifestation of a number can also be found on adjectives and articles. Okay, look in the example in front of you. The uh, le cheval royal, this is singular, the royal horse. When you change it into its plural form, it becomes les chevaux royaux, in which we have the number uh, inflection appearing on the article les. Okay, so you have le becoming les in the plural form, cheval becomes chevaux in the plural form, and royal singular as an adjective becomes royaux in its plural form. In English, you have the royal horses in the plural form, and you have the royal horse in the singular form. The S of the plural appears just on the noun horse, but not on the adjective or the article. The following uh, inflection category is that of gender. Gender displays such contrast as masculine, feminine, neuter, animate or inanimate, etc. For the analysis of word classes. So we can classify uh, words with respect to gender into masculine, feminine or neuter or animate, inanimate and so on. There is a clear distinction between natural gender and grammatical gender. When word items refer to the sex, of a real world entities like girl, women, this is uh, automatically we speak about natural gender. However, the assignment of grammatical gender is quite arbitrary in many cases, either intralinguistically, which means within one and the same language, such as the difference between uh, annar in Arabic, which means fire and al-lahab, flame, in Arabic. So, annar is feminine, whereas al-lahab is masculine, though both of them belong to the same semantic field. It's arbitrary because we, can, we don't know why annar was assigned a feminine gender, whereas uh, al-lahab was assigned a masculine gender. It's arbitrary. Another example, which is interlinguistically, which means if you compare words between different languages, you will find out that it's also arbitrary. The assignment of gender to words is also arbitrary. So look at the example in front of you. We have le soleil in French. It's masculine. Le soleil. In Arabic, ashamsu. Ashamsu is feminine in Arabic. And in English, the sun is neither feminine nor masculine. It is neuter. In English, the sun is neuter. So, as you can see, we refer to the same thing in nature, which is the sun, but when it is used in Arabic, it is feminine. In English, French, it is masculine. In English, in English, it is neuter. This is what we call grammatical gender. Now, we move again to another inflectional category, which is person. Person reveals whether the person or the thing 
is speaking, spoken to, or spoken of. So we have first person single, sig uh, first person signals the speaker. Second person denotes the person spoken to. Third person indicates the person spoken about or of. So, for example, the first person, when you say, I went to Europe this past summer. The speaker, now I am the speaker and I am the doer of the action. It's me who is speaking now and it is me who uh, visited or went to Europe in the past, in the last summer. Second, the second person, when you say you visited London or Europe last month, there is a mistake there, I'm sorry. You visited London last month, didn't you? So I am the speaker, but I am not the doer of the action. So in the first case, I am the speaker and the doer of the action. In the second case, which means in the second person, I am the speaker and somebody else has done the action. In the third case, which is third person, I am the speaker, but the doer of the action is not in front of me. He is away. He is somewhere else. He is absent. So the category of person becomes clear when you consider how it is expressed in traditional Arabic grammar. When you find uh, in, in traditional Arabic grammar words like al mutakallim, damir al mutakallim, the speaker, al muhatab, the person to whom you are speaking, the addressee, and al ghaib the person who is not present is somewhere else not on the spot so in this lecture or in this recording we have seen uh, three types after defining inflection categories we have seen three types of these inflection categories namely person gender and uh, number in the following lecture or recording we are going to see the inflection category of case so thank you very much and see you then.